graduated from Emory Masilisi. It's um, it had the best law school at the time. How many of you remember when you, with two with two forty two you couldn't get the entire diploma to read law? But these days with ninety five you can enter in some states in the north. Yes. So, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, front of house will give me some good. Uh, um, we recently we had that uh, from uh, from the university that Prof came from, that a lion. Lion went to Gaga. There's something that I've, I've come to know <clears throat> that, you know, <laughs> the royal father here, right? And everywhere we see them, we give them their, their respect. Oh, royal fathers, royal fathers. I was flying to Abuja one time with Opa Akiru, and we ran into top legs. That's why the plane was going. I said, I can't be a secret, I said, I can't be a secret. You know where we are. You can play this, doing like this, doing like God is coming, so it's only God. God is the ultimate coming. And I particularly like the fact that everywhere he sees me, uh, back in the like, Ali, come and greet me. Yeah, come to the palace and greet me. But I'm very wary about going to greet Kabiyasi because if you go greet him, you take something. If he comes greet you, you give him something. So you lose both ways. And to make it worse, he's a retired police officer. <laughs> so there's no win-win with his own case. <laughs> of course, there's no reason that I would not uh, say something about uh, President Obasanjo. I remember when we found out how much I was charging. You know, Brother Basanjo is supposed to be chairman of Aradai Bank. He doesn't give anything. Remember when he said that he gave money to bribe the Naba? And he showed you bags of Ghana must go on TV. He said, he said I gave them that money. He said, I don't do But we should be, you know how this is also. When, when he paid me for his uh, wife's 60th, he paid her pass. I was waiting for the balance, and I heard that she had passed. See, I came up my eye, I was like crying. So I went to greet him, and I felt with her. So I was there, and I was crying, and he was crying. So he said, I knew you were very close to her. I said, yes, I don't know where I collect my balance from. <laughs> Chased me, but chased me around the house. Awesome guy. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. So today, for those of you who know of the pedigree of Punch, you will know that we're gathered here for a very significant purpose. Beyond the 50th anniversary that we're here to celebrate, we're here again to say that the role of journalists and in this case print is very key in the growth of every society and development of any economy. And so in a short while I'll be back up on this podium and we will take this program of and kick it off. Thank you very much. You're welcome, everyone. Thank you.
for the journey so far. The title of today's lecture, Recovering the Narrative, is not just a theme, it's a call to action. It is a rallying cry for the media and responsible actors to reclaim their rightful place as the guardians of facts, truth and justice, and the voice of the people. This is so because in a world inundated with information, the power to shape narratives is a formidable responsibility and one that should not be taken lightly. However, my duty today is not to deconstruct the subject. Thankfully, we have a better and more qualified speaker to speak on this important subject. As the most widely read newspaper in the nation, Punch has not only been a witness to history, but a key player in shaping the narratives. Our 50-year resilience is a testament to the power of the press in influencing positive change upholding the values of democracy and championing the cause of the people. We hope that the impact of our 50-year journey would serve as a source of inspiration to all. We have weathered storms, stood against oppression, championed the cause of justice, and we remain unbound and unbroken. Today, I call upon every one of you to join hands in this crucial mission and stand firm as Punch goes into the next 50 years doing what it knows best. I want to take this moment to express my deepest gratitude to all our friends who have stood by us over the decades. Your support has been invaluable. And it is your belief in our mission that propels us forward. A special acknowledgement goes out to all Punchers, past and present. You are the heart and soul of this institution. Your dedication, hard work, and unwavering commitment have been the driving force behind our success. Before I conclude, I would like to draw your attention to the ongoing 50th anniversary photo exhibition that commenced yesterday at the Alliance Française. It is a visual journey through our 50-year history. I encourage each and every one of you to visit, if you haven't already, and immerse yourselves in its memories. In closing, I wish every one of you an enjoyable and enlightening time during this public lecture. I hope that today's lecture will spark a flame within us to actively contribute to recovering the narrative and shaping a future that we can all be proud of. Thank you and let the dialogue begin.
would like to just welcome you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, let us see the Deputy Governor of the State, representative of other governors that are here, Your Excellency, our father, Professor Wale Shaika, who is also the guest speaker here today, the Director of the National Judiciary Agency, my sister, Chairman of Punch, other publishers and members of the media here. My friend, Your Excellency, former speaker, former governor, former minister, present something. It's good to see you here. Gentlemen, I bring you the greetings of uh, His Excellency President Bola Ahmed Chinewu. As you know, he's in Lagos here doing a function and we'll be leaving this afternoon to a state visit he's going to have in Qatar. Distinguished gentlemen, Punch has been here for 50 years and what that tells you is that uh, it is a story of resilience, trust, hard work, and commitment to the Nigeria project. These are exactly the things that President Wala Ahmed Chinubu has always been preaching. And so if Punch has been here for 50 years, it is going to be here for another 50 years by God's grace. Nigeria is facing through hard times now, challenging times, I should say. But this is not new, and this is not peculiar to this country. All the issues we are discussing now are issues that other countries around the world are also discussing. Only a few weeks ago we hear that uh, the United Kingdom has gone into economic recession. I'm glad that it didn't happen here, otherwise the story would be, oh, Nigeria is in recession, as if it is going to be the end of the world for the country. The government of President Bola and the Chinubu has taken, as you know, very bold steps from inception. The first one, of course, being that uh, on assumption of office on day one, he took away fuel subsidy. Second, he also brought parity or unification in the foreign exchange regime. Now, hitherto, these two major issues have been eating deep, deep into our economy. And like someone put it, by the time the president came in, the economy was literally a dead horse standing. There was really nothing in it. And so, whether subsidy was removed or not, it was going to be very challenging. And the president took this very bold step and ensured that this subsidy goes away for the benefit of all. And he didn't pretend from the one that it is not going to be an easy thing. Of course, eight months down the road, we are seeing the effects of some of these hard decisions. But I can tell you, the good story is that government is taking very bold, proactive decisions to ensure that we turn the corner and Nigeria's economy come back again. Let me say this, that government believes that all these things happening are for the good of the country and Nigeria is going to turn the corner and the economy is going to be good again. Only a few days ago, he invited captains of industry, the Dangotes, the, the Boas, the Illumilus, brought in governors at the sub-national level, brought in other ministers from the federal cabinet, and we all locked ourselves in a room for about three and a half hours discussing how Nigeria is going to get better. And Everyone in that room, from the private sector, from the central government, and from the subnationals, believe that this country is going to get better. Of course, the challenges are going to be there. No one is pretending that they don't exist.
But we see a situation where in another one year, the story is going to be quite different. And let me go back to what Professor Wally Schrenker said when he paid a visit to His Excellency President Bola Amit you know, I listened to the journalist who was asking him question to comment about the administration. And what he said was that usually my character, I wouldn't talk until whoever is in office stays at least one year. So I urge you to see wisdom in what Professor Wallace Schenker has said. Allow more time. Of course, you can critique, you can, you know, offer suggestions. But this country has to exist. Let us please talk about all those good things happening in this country. It's not all bad story all the time. The National Bureau of Statistics only recently said that for the first time in a very long time, we are seeing capital import improving by about 66%. Now, if you want to find reason why first of has to go, one reason is that our consumption has gone down by over a billion liters. That's what the NPS, National Bureau of Statistics, said. Over a billion liters. So where were, were those liters going? Where were they going before? Now our domestic refining capacity has also gone up by about 8%. The insecurity that was inherited by government, I mean, my house is in Kaduna, and I drive frequently between Kaduna and, and Abuja, and I know that months back, it was difficult for you to supply that road. It's either you are in the train, which is also very challenging, as you know, you know going by some of the things that have happened. But now, you can leave Abuja and go to Kaduna by 9 p.m. and you are guaranteed that you will get there.
คุณสมไล
to lower the sensibilities of the humanity of claims to serve. This is where the East of language comes in. The secret sign of progress is when one finds that the uh, frequency of certain reprehensible expressions has diminished and eventually even vanishes altogether.
medical procedure. But an hour later, she had become lifeless like a death on the slaughter slab. Like a death on the slaughter slab. Really? This is how to report premature death of another being. This has nothing to do with uh, grammar in any foreign language. Translate it into any indigenous language, and we are still with an accusing question to basic humanity. To find such a degradation of sensibilities in the print media delivered quite a jolt, I must confess. And a war. If the leaf wrapping stays too long of the soap, it will also begin to fall. The question then becomes for me, who is now infecting who? Are we dumbing down in reference to the language of trolls? Freedom of expression implicates also in the choice of expression. And thus, personal as well as corporate responsibility cannot be evaded. One's mind goes immediately to veteran editors such as Latif Yakonde, Ladi Bunola, or further to the present Stanley McCable, Patrick Cole, and that breed. Would such a travesty have left the uh, press room under their watch? If the answer is most probable, then does that indicate that human progress is upwards or downwards? Is a complacent society being programmed to accept as normal what was once unthinkable? Of course, we also have a choice. We can relegate such retrogression to quite a minor glitch, label it isolated, and let it pass. We do this all the time anyway, knowing fully well that it's anything but isolated when we take all the media together. Well, why not? After all, it's only language. Absolutely no relation between the depiction of that cow on a slopper slab, uh, slaughter slab and the story of a, on a succeeding page of the journal. confession of a, a youth, and uh, the title was Why I Slaughtered My Mother and Chopped Her in Pieces. Or he would take that student, this time female, who murdered her lover in a hotel room, then went on to contest in prison a beauty pageant while awaiting trial for murder. Well, enough of these grisly preliminaries. We shall return, in some sense, to them on a related note. The very exercise itself of the fundamental right of free expression and its subversion in the strangest, least expected places. State power, you see, is not always. It's always identifiable, however, that it, do, it does have the capacity and the inclination to grab us by the neck, shake us, spit in our faces. Uh, the kind of license exercised, for instance, by Mr. Vladimir uh, Putin in his feudalist elimination of Alexei Navalny. That is state power for you. However, we must always recognize that even within civil society, we encounter instances of censorship, of the clamping down on the freedom of expression, sometimes in the most brutal, nauseous way. So for now, let us find some relief in indulging a little in the rites of celebration of creativity. That, after all, is the purpose of our gathering here today. We shall proceed now by way of some uh, reminiscences, pausing only to remind ourselves that the creative urge in humanity is unpredictable. Considering our 
religious, uh, religion, cult, uh, saturated environment here. Perhaps the, clear, the nearest expression for it, description, is that creativity is akin to the phenomenon of spiritual possession. Oh, that brings me to the recent Kula Balu, occasioned by a BBC documentary on the religious enterprise rampaging across our dear nation. The question to pose is, why the fuss? Why the attempt to pillory a foreign uh, uh, broadcasting station? Stories are an open field, just like fiction. In fact, it's where fiction and faction meet and intersect. Faction, of course, I'm sure you know is the name for making faction out of fiction. Sometimes in a mix, sometimes just interworking. And reality is the common material which uh, does not accept the existence of boundaries. I mean, after all, if you're talking about a man of God who was responsible for the uh, premature transition of even visitors to the other world, then the factionalization or fictionalization of such an international kind of uh, activity cannot accept the existence of boundaries. In any case, and here we come uh, to uh, a minor revelation. Don't tell me that you missed this connection. I invite you just to revisit that earlier work I spoke about, Chronicles from the land of the happiest people in the world. I know that one of the main characters who proliferates that, uh, that novel was generally known as Father Davina or Teribogo. However, I want you to go through some of his other names. That man of many parts was also known as, at one stage as TBJ. TBJ. Hmm. Roll it in your mouth, and I'll say it a bit more slowly. T B J. One by one. T B J. Well, who else do you think that was referring to? I took some time to study that man, T B Joshua, while he was still alive. I even discussed him with the then governor of Lagos, who had plans to put him to put him on trial for culpable homicide. But then he took off, and I think he ended up in uh, Latin America, which is beginning to rival Nigeria for miracles and wonders and bad theater on stage, on television, of people in possession and being cured and dropping down and foaming and mouth and vomiting snakes and naira and all other kinds of uh, felicitous aspects of Nigerian spirituality. So, leave me busy alone. Instead, just read Chronicles. It's still on sale, and I'm collecting royalties on it. I had um, an interesting connection with the punch, which many people do not know. But first of all, I wonder how many here know that this brainchild, this act of creativity, on the expansion of intelligent discourse was actually uh, almost indistinguishable from one organization called the Committee of Ten. Punch came out at a significant moment in this nation's history. It is when the nation was attempting to recover from the travails of the Civil War. And the Committee of Ten, almost coterminous with Punch, because Punch actually carried uh, most of their point of view, they came into play, and they were great supporters of uh, the then uh, regime of General Yakubu Gawan. 
very good friend of mine. He was my landlord uh, in Kaduna. <laughs> and I, however, I was no fan of his, not at that time, anyway. And so I found myself on the opposing side of both the Committee of Ten and the Punch. The connection was my cousin, in fact, Shobo, the late Shobo Shuemo, who gives me a joy to be able to bring him back to life for a few moments for his former colleagues and friends. And he was a passionate supporter of uh, Lakubu Gawa. He, one of his uh, favorite places was his club in uh, Ikoi. I think it was either Island Club or Yoruba Tennis Club, I can't remember. All I do recollect was that on his way from the, um, his uh, club, I was then teaching at, the, at Lagos University, but I stayed outside in Igbogi. And on his way, he made a point of always stopping by to continue his activities, which he left behind at the club. That involved arriving always with a cold bag filled with beer. I will sit down and, of course, discuss politics. Shubo had at that time, I think it was one of the few people who had sports coupe, especially of the expensive kind. Um, it was either a BMW or a Mercedes. But he hated to drive, and yet he loved that car. But he also loved, curiously enough, he enjoyed watching me drive it. He would even tell me to go faster. He enjoyed just the thrill of riding in it, but he just would never drive that car. So we come, and by the end, of course, of our session, uh, he was never in any good condition to drive, even if he wanted. He loved driving. So he would make me, he would dismiss his driver, and he would make me drive him home, then drive the car back, and then his driver would pick it up with me. Uh, from, uh, from me at the, um, uh, in Ibobi. But it was this point of, he did his best to convert me, but I failed as a pupil. I just remained opposed to the military regime, whoever was heading it, be it Aguiranzi or Gawan or whatever. And eventually, of course, cousin or no cousin, this partnership this tutorship collapsed. And I began to go on air in the press stating my views. And by the time the man died, my prison memoirs came out when I excoriated everybody. My cousin was really heartbroken. The punch did not spare punches. <laughs> the committee of 10, even my cousin felt it was his duty to throw the hardest punch at his dearly beloved cousin. That was the nature of contest in those days. Now, these reminiscences are largely for us to enjoy, to recollect friendly battles and so on. They're not intended to vindicate or uh, excoriate one side of that particular contest. Uh, but also, they're meant to serve a purpose, a warning. What is our warning? Let me uh, narrate it in form of a letter which some of us received from our colleagues in a neighboring country. I quote, Dear Anthony Cornell Noam Wale, I hope this small, this email will find you well. I'm sad, but I would like to inform you about what is going on chaotic socio-political situation in Senegal. A month ago, you were kind enough to sign the petition where we, Senegalese intellectuals, called on Macky Sall, the head of state of Senegal, to stop the instrumentalization of justice. We thought that this appeal, which was very successful, would have brought the head of state to reason. Unfortunately, he has stubbornly carried on with the repression of the opposition and the popular will of the people of Senegal. Today, the consequences are horrible. In the past three days, about 15 very young people were killed by police force 
and the armed militia of the head of state, not to mention those seriously injured alongside thousands of extrajudicial arrests, uh, alongside thousands of extrajudicial arrests. The situation is very worrying and unstable, with drafts, with drifts dangerous for Africa and the Senegalese democracy. Thank you for your attention. That was just about a year ago. I bring this to our immediate perspective, simply because, in case you haven't noticed, a khaki belt has been forming all along the northern subwestern uh, region. These belts don't appear from nowhere for no cause. The causes and the signals are always there. That is one of them. This kind of letter has gone, I'm sure, around the world, other African intellectual writers, the diaspora, nothing new about it. And the warnings are there, and interventions are made. And suddenly, we ask ourselves, why again, we thought we, the Nigerian Civil War as a lesson, plus situations in Burkina Faso, that we've come to the stage where we understand that it's obscene to see a picture in the newspapers, as we've seen in some of these uh, neighboring countries, of civilians carrying soldiers triumphantly, as if here come once again the saviors, as if we have not been there before. That very letter was followed shortly, by the way, that's the first letter about a year ago, with some of the most violent scenes that Senegal has ever encountered since its independence from a European nation. This year, just a few days ago, another letter came from the same source and to the same people. Here goes. Dear yes, sir, dear all, I hope you're well. Surely you are aware that Senegal is currently undergoing a major crisis. The President of the Republic has abruptly halted the electoral process, cancelling for the first time in Senegal's history the presidential elections scheduled for February 25. That's a couple of days ago. With his mandate ending on April 2nd, he has decided to postpone elections to December 15. The entire country is in anger. It is uncertain what will happen, but it's highly likely we're gathering, we're entering a cycle of uncomfortable violence. This head of state and his entourage have been involved in many malpractices that he fears for his own safety. We, intellectuals, civil societies, and polit political parties are organizing ourselves for resistance. That's the current situation. I will keep you informed of development and actions to be taken. Best regards, etc., etc. So, what is it? Just what is, is it that happens to us on this landmass? Nice. The khaki belt, cordon sanitaire, that I mentioned earlier, is of course consolidating. Cons not only consolidating, but preparing itself, if it hasn't already, to secede from the umbrella body ECOWAS. They're encouraged, of course, as you may have noticed, by the fact that they have European support. But this time, from another side, no longer the Western imperialists, no. It's now the Eastern, former Eastern Bloc, shall we say. And it's a very curious uh, coincidence, perhaps, or perhaps there's a pact among the leaders of the new world that only Francophone members uh, regions are admitted. Could be a coincidence. An attempt was made to involve an Anglophone, but that somehow petered out. And so we're abandoning Francophonie, and in some cases, many cases, Anglophonie, and now we're entering Russophonia, substituting one imperialist order 
for another. I mean, there is nothing wrong with that. There's a, a quite uh, comforting way of viewing it, of saying, for instance, good, serve the West right. Yes, the chickens are coming home to roost. Let the Western imperialists now understand, get a feel of what it is like to be robbed of what was never yours. Vladimir Putin, after long years of denial of his surrogate forces, the Wagner Group, been operating on this continent, finally felt it was time to come clean. It was rather like he'd been listening to us in Nigeria. And after viewing the West, we'd had a field for so many decades, centuries in fact, decided to convene his own one-man Berlin conference and moved out. I think he was listening to some of our electionary campaign. So he looked the Western forces in the face and he said, in Milokon. <laughs> and that's where we are today. And the question I have to ask again and again is this. Is it really necessary to substitute one imperial force for another? We were limping along, I admit. Lots of programming, insurrection, religious fanaticism, uh, extremism of all kinds, marginalization, hunger, food shortages. Yes, all that we admit. But is true liberation really impossible? Do we actually have to go through surrogates, distant empires, in order to come to fulfillment? ask ourselves whether there isn't an instinct to perpetuate the unfinished business of nation being, which is one of the major causes of the entry of military force into our lives. This does not excuse, no, please don't misunderstand. Military intervention in civic life is unprincipled, it's opportunistic, and very often, it's simply dehumanizing. Nobody wants it. Even ex-soldiers, who fortunately have had a taste of the other side, have come out, I think you all heard him, saying, I don't want to return to military rule. But if along the coast, along the West African coast, conduct such as I have just narrated continues, who can blame? the crowd for coming out and carrying soldiers once again, shoulder high, and saying, welcome, redeemers. I believe it's time we learn to stop the cycle of violence, especially through invoking the forces of violence which only subjugate us, either directly or in association with alien forces. Among those alien forces, I wish to group also the religious. And through that, to highlight a case that tests, indeed questions, a very claim to a single nation. If we operate by dual, under a dual mandate of justice, we cannot be surprised if from time to time that sovereignty that we treasure so much, that we preen so much, that we sing so much about in the national anthem is put to the test. We congratulate ourselves saying that, yes, we survived a civil war, that we installed the three R's, reconciliation, reconstruction, etc. I forgot what the third one was, three R's. 
giving the lie to some of us who said a people once decided on secession can never be defeated. That expression, I remember, was taken very literally as if the battlefield is the only arena of struggle. If it is, if that were true, then tell me, what is IPOP? Why Maso? Is the civil war really over? And civil wars will continue as long as civil society, governance especially, gives cause to place people under such strain that they begin to question whether they can claim national belonging or, to use the most common word, just jakpa outside, and seek even second-class citizenship elsewhere, degrading almost, degraded almost to the level of unpaid serfs. We tend to underestimate the issue of notion being. And yet the tests come again and again, stressing our understanding of the measure, the entitlement of citizen in relation to governance, of sections in relation to the other. We cajole ourselves that that massive testing that cost this nation some two million lives, it is estimated, whether that testing really has been overcome. But then I ask the question again, if that civil war, if that stressing of nation being were truly over, if it ended with the ritual of the signing of the articles of surrender, I ask myself then, why Nassau? Why Nassau? Just a few weeks ago, I read in the papers that the organization known as ICOP had sent a message to the government demanding that a plebiscite be conducted in their own area to determine the will of the people. The first sensation, of course, is not again, but no. The sensation should be, oh, so it's not all over. I assume it's not fake news, it probably could be, I admit, but the very fact that such a, a statement gains currency in the media and is not contradicted uh, says something of nation's stability and acceptance going on in Nigeria. The question What's wrong? The will of We conduct censors from time to time. We rejig the formalities between, uh, between states internally, our relationship with other nations. Look at the direction of Ukraine. We see the horror going on in Gaza. Enough, we find that on this continent, no far less what is going on. What's going on in Gaza and the Ukraine? All we can deduce from this, extract from this, nation. Uh, manifested, I beg your pardon, it is functioning. In the naming or admission to the club of the United Nations. And the question then is why not? I've gone on record as that there's nothing about being. It is a in progress. It becomes part of certain marginalized sections or those who feel marginalized, never mind the causes, then there's nothing wrong with testing the actual desire of a people. There's one corollary, however, 
and for me this is a logical one. If a section of any nation, a people, have a right to test their will, the genuine aspirations of their own people, the rest also have a right to decide to expel part of their own uh, their own piece of real estate. If the protocols that brought those parts together in the first place are being flouted deliberately, flouted. I bring up this corollary because some of us, believe it or not, are obsessed not just with language, but by the very institution of justice. I find it difficult, personally, to accept, for instance, how it is possible for us to is sort of a Eventually, but these two of them identified the protocol. Adjournment, right? Because the prosecution failed to show up. No show. Eventually, the judge, in all his majesty, had no choice, it seemed, but to dismiss the case. Let me cite. Kind of rebuke to what has happened by the case. The report per Justice Inyang as the Attorney General of the Federation, Dili Giwa's killers to justice because the killing violates the right to life under the Nigerian Constitution and the African Charter of human and people's rights. Now, the death of Dele Giwa is close to 50 years ago. If last week a judge still found it possible, logical, and constitutional to order the Attorney General of the nation to bring Dele Giwa's killers to justice, then what happened in the case of Deborah Samuel? Just what happened there? Why is that case nearly forgotten already? It went beyond that, the outrage, the, the violence that was lodged, launched against this nation, us as a people. It was not just that Deborah Samuel was killed and that is uh, the suspects set free. We discovered months later, just recently, that there was another woman, Rhoda Jutau, who'd been in prison for daring to make a video condemning the lynching of Deborah Samuel. She was released eventually after, I think, about 13 months in jail as a result of the work of human rights and some Christian associations. I hope we all see the logical progression of this. If a mother of five could be imprisoned for condemning an illegal and brutal act, well, what's the conclusion? It means that even when one's own people are lynched, the family will be guilty of mourning. That is a logical conclusion. That's the direction in which such nation building is going. But the insults go even further. 
go turn to the social media, you'll see that image. Till today, of one of the killers posing and holding up a box of matches, saying in effect, this is the instrument with which I committed the final act, which was setting Deborah Samuel's body on fire. He has not been arrested, not been charged for inciting hate. But anyway, why should he be charged? The mullah of Abuja uh, uh, Mosque blessed the act. It had hardly been over before he issued a statement. I deliberately accepted an engagement in Abuja so that I could say on the spot of that violation, say to Buhari, remove that man. He is not fit to preside over any institu spiritual institution. Anybody who commends immediately should be found guilt tried for inciting emulation, not left to preside over an institution of spirituality. Did I expect my uh, challenge to be taken off? Of course not. I was living in another nation. No, not even another nation. I was speaking from another planet, I beg your pardon. So when we talk about nation being, nation building, and the centrality of it to even development, in racial recognition, which is something that belongs to every individual, we're not talking in vacuum. We're talking about the very erosion of the basis of nation being, being committed, being addressed almost on a regular basis. When the word restructuring is bruted around, we often hear the challenge, hey, what do you mean by restructuring? Well, I don't even like the word restructuring. I use, I prefer the expressions like reconfiguration, decentralization. Everybody can grasp that. Decentralization. And those who lead us, they recognize the necessity of it. They recognize the importance, almost the inevitability of it, until they get in power. Yes, that's the difference, until they get in power. Deconstruction, reconfiguration, decentralization, all this is necessary in order to maximize development. We speak about uh, food hunger because it is real, but uh, palliatives are temporary stopgap. Policies. They do not reach to the heart of the problem, which is one of decentralized development as massively as possible. I've attended food conferences, workshops really, all over the world from Makarere to India, even to Paris, to Sochi, at least conferences in which the whole issue, and Munich, the issue of food security. Is, has been addressed. And we know, we found the common, uh, the consensus is that collectivization is an obsolete word, especially when it comes to food production and access to food. So reconstruction, decentralization is not a slogan. And it is time that we stop the pretend decentralization conferences, which have been proved to be mere distractions, especially by those who have a different agenda in mind, such as third agenda, third term agenda. Uh, it does not mean that nothing of value has come out of some of the conferences we've had in the past. No. So the tones are there. People have worked at proposals, in spite of even knowing that they've been brought together for a charade. I can tell you about even 
my own uh, Oba, uh, one of our Obas that chose me in Ogo State, he came to me and said, ah, you know, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And we've nominated you to go and represent us. I said, where? He's going nowhere. He came back later and said, you were right. I said, proper why you? He said, they wasted that time. He said, they fed us well, though. They gave us allowances. He said, but it was all a waste of time. It's about time, I think, for this nation, you know, that people stop, leaders stop taking this nation for a ride. You know we must decentralize. Security, you know, has become a bugbear. From all corners of the nation, that is the cry. Decentralize. Simply so that government can come closer to the people and productivity can really be manifested as a product of citizens, not simply as a manna from a heaven. That is the attitude that I mean, uh, obtains at the, at the moment. Let me, so that, um, yes, I know that the fear, fear is one of collapse, break up. That's been the excuse being given by several regimes. But suppose the nation is breaking up informally. In other words, as a fact rather than as theory. Then hadn't you better just address this, come straight on and see exactly what happened? What is wrong with general representatives sitting down and saying this, this should be the protocols of association? Anything outside of it, anyone who does not want to accept these protocols, abide by these protocols and manifest these protocols in the act should take a walk. I have no problem at all with even what is known as a nation beginning as a, a vast football field and ending up as a ping pong table. If that is going to restore dignity to citizens, if that is going to guarantee three square meals a day, then so be it. One of my favorite expressions, which people say is extreme, is let nations die that humanity may live. That's something. <laughs> Finally, because I know some people will be very disappointed if I do not at least end up touch on this subject, I wish to uh, uh, just a little uh, postscript, and it goes in the form of the transmission to you of an exchange. You see, we have a problem. We began with the issue of language, and it's a serious one, because you can actually transform humanity if language is used in the right, humanized way. And so, and also, <coughs> For us even to get to the state of using language as humanized, we have to ensure the free flow of information, of communication, which is the reason why some of us have taken the trouble to gather here today in a mood of celebration. So, the postscript. I said earlier that free speech is constantly under threat, and sometimes we're looking in the wrong way. We wake up only when atrocities on the level of the murder of a, a champion of democracy, a champion of free speech, a critic of authoritarianism is murdered in a cell. It takes our mind also to similar events here, MK Abiola, Yaradua, whose deaths are supposed to be mysterious, but we all know what happened. And so Putin can talk from here to eternity. And make all the, oh, he's finally handed over the body, thank goodness, for small mercies. But sometimes civil society is its own worst enemy when it comes to freedom of speech. You say something unpalatable, 
hear, and the next moment you hear that your ancient grandmother's house in your village has been burnt down. Well, that is censorship in a terminal form. And so let me just uh, decide this little exchange. Uh, it's between two, hand, uh, two people. Let's call one a handler, the other troll. Handler, your online performance was pathetic. We expected better from you. We expect better from you this time round. Troll, sir, I did my best. Handler, which kind best? Your orders were to get online and scatter him to the four winds. Troll, with all due respect, sir, easier said that. I did not understand what the man was saying. Handler, did anyone ask you to understand anything? We said, whenever he opens his mouth, don't care about the subject, just jump down his throat. End of dialogue. Now, a friendly message. Be very careful. The apt expression, slightly adapted, goes, think before you leave especially down the uh, time-weathered throats that you encounter. You may end up being swallowed intact without any condiments, then expelled through the rear end of the human anatomy. End of message. Thank you very much. So that nobody will come and uh, try to, to force anything down my time where that goes. I, I found out that some of our guests that came in need to be recognized. I'd like to recognize the presence of a former governorship candidate of PDP in Lagos, Mr. Chinyabazi. I recognize the presence of Venerable ADPC Adebayo, representing the Bishop of the Ghost Houses, Welcome, Recognize the presence of uh, Depo Ulubuagba, National Public Secretary of PDP, is here. Recognize the president. Thank you very much. I would like to recognize the presence of my excellency, the Our excellency, Mrs. Tony Saraki, founder and president of World Bank Foundation Africa. Welcome. And she's here with my friend, uh, Mrs. Ekwa. Providers of Greenwood House. Welcome. We recognize the guests. Thank you. A round of applause, please. 
when intellectual discourse are mentioned, there's this mind that uh, I'd like to read from to here. I recognize the presence of uh, a renowned accountant, Pashon J. Rappel. Welcome, sir. Oh, wow. Um, I, I have to recognize the presence of the auntie, my auntie, my, my uncle's wife, and uh, the, one of the proprietors in the space of uh, publishing. Every time I'm at an event and I see her mentioning some things that need to be done, I, I quickly begin to wonder why she didn't even just go into event management because she takes details seriously. Please, let's welcome my auntie, Mary Ego. Give her a round of applause. Always have a nice All right, um, I recognize the presence of, um, there was a play we had, television program we had one time that addressed the issues of the honorables who represented us. And this woman came in from London and took her part when we worked with Lai and recognized the presence of Mrs. Taiwo Ajayi Lai She just celebrated her birthday and then she was uh, honored again by the creative industry. Welcome, Mom. Uh, the list is okay. Uh, the representative of the High Commissioner, okay, official in the office of the High Commissioner of Canada, Jeremy Christoph, Mr. Demilade. Yeah, Mr. Demilade. Yeah, let's, let's see later. It's not for this afternoon. <laughs> Around two weeks, I should be traveling. <laughs> We recognize, we recognize the presence of so the, the members of the academia that are here. Uh, the DG National Orientation Agency is here, Mr. Larry, Mr. Omi. Thank you very much for coming. The DG Advertising Regulatory Council of Nigeria is also here, and you know that uh, they play a major role in publishing uh, and keeping the newspaper houses alive. Thank you. That said. Normally, when a lecture is done like this, there are questions that would be asked. Um, I'm taking liberty to say that the lecture went down very well. If you have any questions, there, yeah, just see if you have questions. Any questions? Question? Question? Oh, you have a question? Okay, so send it to me later. I'll pass it on to Prof. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so there's one question there for Prof. Any other question? Any other question? So please come, come quickly so we can take your question and uh, Prof will uh, speak to it if I, if I, after we hear the question, Prof will just speak to it quickly about that. Um, I called somebody one time to come and ask a question after a lecture and the person came up and said, how are they getting home? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you for giving us this inspirational uh, lecture, which motivates a lot of us. Uh, sir, my concern is the true representative that we talk about. How are we going to ensure that we actually have the true representative that will go and talk in the interest of the public as against what we are seeing, which is basically commercialization of interest. The kind of political system that we have, if you don't disrupt it, there's no way you can have genuine representation of people because it's totally commercialized. And when they go there, they're not going to talk about the public interest. They are going to be talking about how they can amass more wealth and create this confusion, decision that we are seeing, which is not a solution. So even if you balkanize Nigeria in 200 times, how are we sure, sir, that those elements are going to actually help to bring the end of the poverty that we are seeing, which is artificial, the insecurity that we are seeing, the underdevelopment that we are seeing in this country. So I just want to be enlightened on that, sir. Thank you. Okay, so you are asking how can we succeed in correcting the things that he has said? Uh, 
If you are laughing at that, you are just the question. (laughs) 
I insinuated something and some of you actually found it funny. Yesterday we did an exhibition, and the exhibition was a collage of some of iconic pictures that were taken and published by, by Punch. And uh, these pictures uh, go beyond just photography. They tell the news, they reflect the society, they crystallize our consciousness and help to shape society, as I said. And so I think those were the days that we were trying to show what technology is uh, not helping us. Please, can, can the Abbasid government help us with lies? <laughs> yeah. I didn't say Abia, I said Abbasid. Thank you. More lines, please. You can take your screen back. All right, so now we're going to take uh, goodwill messages, and um, I'd like to first invite the representative of the governor of Ednubu State to please come say something, the Honorable Commissioner information, please. Honorable Commissioner, representing His Excellency Dr. Peter Mbappa. Honorable Aka Izeyaka. to make sure that as the required spread newspaper in the country, 
We want to get your partnership to tell you all about our story. Thank you very much and God bless you. of the Delta State Governor and the Enugu State Governor, the former Minister of Transportation and former Governor of River State, His Excellency Right Honorable Rutsumi Amechi, former Minister of Youth and Sports, Mr. Sunday Gary, the Senator, former Senator representing Ogo East uh, Constituency, Senator Lekon Mustafa, the wife of the former governor of Kwara State, Her Excellency Mrs. Toin Saraki, former Minister of Industries, Chief Mrs. Monique Po Akonde, CON, the chairman of Punch Newspapers, Mrs. Angela Emua, 
Our guest lecturer, the revered Professor Wale Shoyinka, the former chairman of Punch Newspapers, Chief Ajibola Okoshola and his wife, the chairman of the Guardian Newspapers, Lady Lady Ibu MFR, the director general of the Nigerian Orientation Agency, Malam Lanre Isa Onilu, the core marshal of the Federal Road Safety Corps, Alaji Gauda Ali Bill, all representatives of service chiefs who are here. The Registrar of JAM, Professor Isaac Oluede, the Board of Trustees of the Newspapers, all royal fathers who are here. The MD, Editor-in-Chief of the Punch Newspapers, Mr. Joseph Adeyeye, all editors of newspapers who are here present, all journalists who are here, especially newspaper men and women, distinguished guests, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's an honor to stand here before you today representing the Governor of Ogo State, His Excellency Prince Dapo Abiodo COA, at this 50th anniversary lecture of the Punch Newspapers. Over the past five decades, Punch has been a stalwart in journalism, embodying the spirit of truth, integrity, and fairness reporting. The story of the Punch is that of its visionary founding chairman, Chief J.O. Abonere FCA, who left prematurely, and the able men and women who picked up his gauntlet and have stared it to this day. The story cannot be complete without acknowledging the editors, journalists, and staff, who I believe the chairman fondly referred to as the punchers, who have tirelessly dedicated themselves to the pursuit of an informed and enlightened society. In an era where the media landscape is constantly evolving, punch has consistently adapted, remaining a beacon of reliable information. The Punch newspaper's legacy is not just in its longevity, but in the impact it has had on shaping the narrative of our nation. Its commitment to investigative journalism and unwavering pursuit of the truth have played a pivotal role in shaping public discourse. As we celebrate this remarkable milestone, let us reflect on the power of the press to hold those in power accountable. To give voice to the voiceless and to foster a society built on transparency and accountability. Our government in Ogo State appreciates the punch as a reliable and dependable media house which has maintained all these attributes described above despite the financial pressures which have caused other publications to lower their standards and ethics and now practice pay to report journalism or clickbaiting. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of His Excellency Prince Dapwabiolu, I congratulate the punch and congratulate them also on behalf of the good people of Ogo State on this golden jubilee. May the next 50 years see the Punch newspaper continue to be a force for good, championing the values that define the essence of journalism. Thank you very much for listening and do enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Okay. I would uh, implore that she stays here so we can take the picture. Um, I'm not calling this because I'm calling Your Excellency uh, Professor Polishing at this. Uh, we need to take the picture. Excellency, uh, of the picture. Uh, can you take this box, please? The Civic Center. Can you take the screen back box? Um, let me make the evil, please. 
would like to have your dog. assignment this evening, so I will keep it simple and short. I stand on existing protocols, and on behalf of the Board of Point Nigeria Limited and the management, I say a big thank you to all of you for joining us here today to celebrate this milestone. Particularly, I would like to thank our distinguished lecturer, Professor Wale Inka, for graciously acceding to our request and also um, speaking after waiving the usual consideration that a species often attracts. Thank you very much for that, sir. And to the rest of us, I say a big thank you to you for, making up, for helping us to make this event a successful one. And I wish you a very pleasant evening ahead. 
Thank you and God bless you.
just finished a lecture on recovering that narrative from Mr. Professional, rather, Professor Wale Shoyinka. And I have here with me. Tui Onjora Saraki, founder and president of the Wellbeing Foundation Africa. Beautiful man. Thank you very much. So what are your takeaways from today's lecture? Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the Abodari family and the board and management and publishers of the Punch newspaper, arguably Nigeria's most widely read newspaper, for actually commemorating their 50th anniversary celebration in such an academic way. Professor Shoyinka's lecture was, as always, incisive. He certainly focused our minds on certain pertinent issues, not just in Nigeria, but also in the countries surrounding Nigeria. And I think um, what happened today was recovering the narrative for all of us to focus on the past, the present, and look to our future with a very clear and concise expectation of what we should be getting from democratic governance, what we should be getting in security, what we should be getting in jobs and in employment, and also as citizens and individuals, how we can begin to focus on localization of the required investments in Nigeria. Thank you so much. It begs to say you really enjoyed today's lecture. I did indeed. <laughs> and what would you like to say to those that couldn't make it here? What I'd like to say is that, you know, some of the things that were highlighted here today are the importance of truth, the importance of accountability, and also the importance of being able to take autonomous decisions. And these are features that I think will help every individual in Nigeria as we strive to build our country. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Thank you so much. Yes, I know you know it's Ali Baba, but I still want to Go ahead, go ahead with the questions. Okay, so please tell me, what part of the lecture today was so profound? What part of the lecture that Professor Malaysia Yika took today, what part of it was so profound to you? Okay, so well, one, one of the, the very the many things, but one of the points that I'd like to remember is that uh, he talked about the healthy uh, criticism that 
prevailed back in the days, where someone can say something and not get mobbed, where someone can make, uh, can give a criticism of anything, even in the military regime, uh, and uh, believe that uh, the exchange of intellectual discourse was important for a thriving journalistic uh, platform like Punch, and also he made of uh, his uh, cousin who had uh, with him uh, differences with him, in spite of the fact that they were very close and they were cousins on issues of ideas and opinions. They deferred and it was just about expression of same. It did not go into making anybody, uh, throwing anybody off the, under the bus or quarreling with anybody or picking fights with somebody. And that was the family. And he felt that, uh, so he then mentioned um, the challenges that uh, journalists went through. He went through the history. He talked about uh, the judiciary, how the judiciary has failed to bring justice to certain cases like uh, Delegiwa, uh, that 50 years or so running, Delegiwa's case is still unresolved. Uh, he talked about uh, the quality of language that journalists should use, that journalists should be humane and in writing stories. In spite of the fact that you want to drive traffic, there are certain things you should not do. He talked about people who try to dress up the truth. Um, so it was a very, it was a very deep lecture. Uh, he mentioned politics. He talked about how politicians have uh, trivialized the essence of truth. Uh, how he has been drawn into uh, these uh, many cases before, and I believe that uh, a lecture like this of 50 years. Who better could do justice to this? And so it was very heartwarming and uh, educative to listen to him. Uh, his depth of um, his intelligence, the depth of his intelligence, and uh, how he he now interweaves all of that experience outside Nigeria and everything to drive home his point. It was crazy. It was very interesting. So Walesha Ika said something. He said, let nations die and humanity leave. What message was possible to give that statement? Because the thing is that it meant that we should not be talking about ourselves as a nation, but we should talk about ourselves as individuals. Because once the individuals are good and better and safe, nations will grow. Uh, it is like saying that uh, it is not the school that makes the child. It's the child that makes the school. So if the children are graduates and they are showing off well that they are good students of that country, a nation is built. So his point is, uh, is very clear, uh, laced it with a lot of humor, uh, and uh, I think that uh, he was a great choice, it was a great choice. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing us with your presence. And we have heard from Ali Baba. We have somebody else coming to join us soon. Professor Polisha Inka said so many profound things, and I would love to hear from one other person. Please come, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma Good afternoon. How, How are you? you? Doing today? Very well. You look absolutely lovely. I mean, I saw you at the photo exhibition yesterday, and your gilly was standing out. And today, oh my God, I have a lot to say. But after this, your name, please. I'm Dr. Ama. Great to meet you, ma'am. Lovely so, to meet you. How was today's lecture for you? You know, today as a whole is just an extension of yesterday, and here we are celebrating the legacy of Punch. 50 years is amazing, and we know that another 50 years will come with ease. But today's lecture really encapsulates what Punch is about, which is telling stories, being really forthright with the information. The use of language was repeated today on many occasions, and recognizing that it's language communicate but it's also language that makes us human. And it's just dynamic to be here and to have the lecture and then the exhibition yesterday. And so the storytelling continues and brand is really about storytelling and truth, authenticity. So speaking generally to journalism, what, how do you think it can reshape our media space? Can you repeat the question because there's a lot of that. Okay, apologies. Speaking of narrative journalism, because Professor Wale Shoyinka rather said a lot. So how do you think it can reshape our media world? 
Well, you know, narratives really is about storytelling, isn't it? And so you've got to know what it is that you're trying to put across to the audience and make sure that that message gets across because that becomes the brand. The brand is about how you tell the narrative. And when you can look at the narrative from the perspective of the people, which is the most important, then you engage with people in a way that makes them feel connected to your brand. And that's, that's very important. And that's what I see with the punch brand connecting with the people authentically but telling the story of the people and not some other story that you manufacture. So how has punch impacted you in 50 years? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I've got to be honest to say that um, Punch is the first newspaper to represent my brand in Nigeria and so I have a personal connection with Punch and I know that I can rely on the story to be what it is. I can reply on the quality of the writing because it is about writing and um, it has a beautiful way of using photojournalism to get the message across even when there aren't any words. So it's just a brilliant, it's brilliant to see it thrive and I do believe that it will continue to thrive beyond another 50 years. Thank you so much ma'am for gracing us with your presence. Thank Everyone, you. the delectable Dr. Amar. Thank you so much ma'am. And you too, ma'am. Thank you so much. Great. So we have heard from so many great people today. And we have having one more person with me to talk, to speak rather, to the lecture of the day. Please, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. How are you doing today? I am fine, thank you. How was today's lecture? It was great, indeed, because very inciting. Um, it's an opportunity to hear once again from the sage, Wale Okay, What's your name, sir? My name is Aka Eze. Aka. I am the Commissioner for Information in the State. Great to meet you, sir. Thank you. So speaking to narrative journalism, how do you think that this lecture can reshape journalism? Well, you can see when he was pointing out at the language that people used, about particularly the when he was mentioning the narrative of uh, a lady who was killed, who went into an operation, and when he was coming out, it was like a, uh, it's a cow set for slaughter. It, it only goes to show that language can, can program people's mind towards um, setting an agenda for the country. I believe that this lecture will help not only uh, mainly journalists to redirect the narratives of uh, their stories. If you clearly understood what he was saying, that what happens in, uh, in countries ab abroad, they are still happening in Nigeria, but we extrapolate our own to the extent that it becomes very damaging to the image of the country. So there is need also to protect our image. There was recession in, uh, in the UK, and there had been recession in Nigeria, but that of UK was almost unknown. So I believe that, as he said, there's need for us to change the narrative to make sure that our country's image is protected. Okay, seemingly with all that she said, I would just like to ask you this one question as we make it a wrap. So, Professor Wallace Ring has made a statement, quite profound, if I must say, and it says, let nations die and humanity live. What did you get from that? Well, uh, he was, in, in his characteristic nature, he believes that human beings are more important than nations. But it's, it's also a mixture of uh, his uh, art and the uh, craft nature of um, delivering messages. But he was saying that if a nation should exist, it must protect its citizens. Because if you look through the, the, the gallery of, uh, this, of uh, the punch newspaper that I saw yesterday, you see 